Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation number 88, recorded January 23rd, 2013. Eric Kuhn, Founders Card. Triangulation is brought to you by Pond5, the world's stock media marketplace. If you're a media maker looking for video, photos, illustrations, music, sound effects, after effects, templates, or 3D models, check out Pond5. And for an exclusive 50 free stock media files, visit pond5.com slash triangulation. It's time for Triangulation, the show where we get great and interesting and and, and fascinating people were actually doing something online or in the technology sphere, and we get to talk to them, sit down with them for an hour. Uh, got a great guest for you this week, a guy who uh, kind of changed the way uh, uh, textbooks were sold, uh, completely disintermediated a business that, that really was a high margin business, <laughs> and I'm sure made some enemies in the process, and has now created a, kind of a club for entrepreneurs called Founders Card. Welcome, Eric Kuhn. Are you in the Thanks. Founders Card space? Is that where that is, where you are right now? I am. You can see part of the space behind me in uh, chilly New York City down in Soho. So is if I'm so if, what is Founders Card? Let's start right at the top. Yeah, so the best way to understand Founders Card is to quickly understand my background, because Founders Card is the community that I wish I always had when I was building and growing the first company I started, Varsity Books when I had started uh, an internet company in the late 90s and uh, basically went from two of us with an idea to a public company in less than two years. Wow. And, and then after the dot-com crash, we were faced with having to rebuild the business. And while we were public, you know, I always use the analogy of sort of rebuilding an airplane midair and uh, uh, had to completely change the model in an attempt to get profitable uh, which we were fortunately able we were able to do, but not without considerable ups and downs and starts and stops, and really just all the tremendous challenges and and obstacles that pretty much any and every uh, entrepreneur can identify with. And through that experience, and you know, after we we sold Varsity Books about uh, four or five years ago, and I was deciding what to do next and had this idea for reinventing the membership model, I thought who better to do that for than entrepreneurs and sort of fellow founders. And I wanted to bring together two things that I wish I had when I was going through that varsity books experience. The first was a strong networking component, sort of opportunities to, to collaborate and meet and even commiserate with fellow founders and entrepreneurs going through similar experiences. It could be lonely at times being an entrepreneur and we have amazing networking events for our members. But what I also wanted to do and what we've also, we've, we've sort of become known for was to create uh, an amazing collection of ongoing benefits for our members who are able to take advantage of, you know, whether it's exceptional rates and VIP a status with, with airlines or hotels or business products like a, an AT&T or Apple um, and, and to do it in a way that was sort of very curated and set apart and incredibly valuable and, and aspirational. That's what we were trying to achieve with, with Founders Card. So it's a long-winded way of saying we are an organization for leading entrepreneurs, uh, giving them networking opportunities and incredible uh, benefits and, and access. But it's not a credit card, despite the word card. It's not. We have a very cool um, membership card, which I will show you in oh, one second. Oh, let me second, see it. Yeah, let's see have. the card. <laughs> Grab a membership card. Is it etched into titanium? Here we go. Should have come equipped That's with right. props. It is. So it's metal. It is metal. Very cool metal membership card that uh, this is the key to, to everything. And you know, basically, uh, this you know, every one of our members has a customized, engraved membership card. Where you know, when they go to one of our hotels to get the the Founders Card rate, they show that upon check-in, uh, they're at the John Barbado store to to get their preferred pricing. They pull out their 
their uh, card. But no, we are not a credit card. And, uh, you know, for us, we didn't want to be burdened or complicated with a sort of financial regulation and, and that side. We're strictly a membership organization for entrepreneurs. You know, Varsity was, there's a, there's a picture on the web of a founder's card so you can see what it, uh, it looks like. It it's, uh, looks beautiful. It's metal, perforated on the right. Steve Wozniak's business card looks kind of like that. He says he can cut meat with it. Can you cut meat with the founders? I've, I've been told. Yeah, there's all sorts of our members tweet the card and describe what what uh, <laughs> what they've done with it. <laughs> it's pretty funny. We on our blog we have we have some of those highlights. Yeah. Let me before we uh, I want to talk more about Founders Club because and because a couple of things. Uh, some of my friends are members, and it sounds like it's pretty cool. But also, it's big. It's it's two years old, and you've got ten thousand members. Uh, that's pretty impressive. But before we uh, before we do, I want to ask a little bit about the Varsity Books experience because that's kind of a, a classic startup uh, where you saw, I, I take it, you saw the opportunity to do on the internet something, uh, a business that would really change the way textbooks were sold. Sure. So, I mean, this is back in 1997. If you could think pre-iPad, pre-digital, pre-all the, the rental textbook companies, you know, basically... All it was before we came onto the scene were the the big bad college bookstores that everyone remembers that right. horrible experience. And so we were the the first to have the silly, crazy, innovative, whatever you want to call it, idea to take that business business online. It was back at a time when Amazon, if anyone can remember back then, they they were strictly focused on you know general interest books. It hadn't yet expanded beyond that. And so what we were going to do and, you know, what we, we did when we launched was to take that uh, multi-billion dollar industry and, and give it an online solution. And, they and did, the, by the way, <laughs> were they happy to go along for the ride? Does, generally speaking, these multi-billion dollar industries kind of want to keep the status quo. Oh, yeah. We, um, <laughs> you got sued we a lot, a lot of We got sued. We... And there, there would be conferences um, when these 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 large bookstore, uh, man, when the managers at the traditional bookstores would get together. I remember going to one conference shortly after we launched, and there was a whole seminar about how to compete with with Varsity Books and <laughs> all the threat. I I, th I think within I don't know about two months after we launched, we had a parade of publishing textbook publishing CEOs and very large. Um, uh, bookstore CEOs that would sort of descend onto our townhouse in DuPont Circle in Washington, D.C., where we were based at the time, to kind of check it out and figure out what was going on. Because, yes, yeah, you know, you just said it. This was an industry that never experienced competition. Uh, customer service was not their forte. If you, yeah. <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden, there was this threat of a complete sort of changing mind-blowing changing business that scared a lot of people. Oh yeah, the yeah, the, the less competition an industry has, the more terrified they are when the, the, you know, the internet kids come marching in. And as I remember, in fact, we have somebody in our chat room who was a, a campus rep. You used students to sell the books. We did, so we deployed a whole host of marketing techniques. And you know, like so many of those early internet companies, you know, that was you know, sort of the, the downfall, if you will, the, those models required heavy, heavy marketing costs. One of the more innovative things we did that, that was more cost effective was to, to employ a whole army of college reps on college campuses right. that would you know, basically market in a grassroots way to, to uh, students on the campus. But what we also did, like so many of those uh, those initial companies, we, we never bought Super Bowl ads, but we did pretty much everything else. <laughs> and I, I think within the, the second year, we, you know, we, we had raised, uh, I think it was about $40 million of venture capital money and wow. then went public and raised another 40. Wow. But uh, like so many of those companies, we were losing money uh, faster than, than you could uh, raise it. And, uh, and so, you know, after we went public, it was, it was, I think it was February of 2000. We were, the week we went public. Oh, geez. We, it was, like, no joke, it was uh, Pets.com. Yeah. You probably remember them. Yeah. Uh, Us Varsity Books and a few of those others. It was like the tail end of when a consumer business uh, a B2C company could go public. And, and then uh, it crashed. Oh, it crashed. And uh, it crashed quickly and ferociously. 
And within, within weeks, the stock price had melted. The, um, the whole sort of mindset, you know, if you can imagine the going, going public is supposed to be a pinnacle, at least, at least a highlight uh, in a company's history. And you know, we had this jolt of adrenaline and excitement going public and recently minted public company. And then almost it felt like immediately after it was probably, you know, two to six weeks after, um, everything just started unraveling. Uh And it was a, it was a scary time because, um, a lot of people didn't really know if it was just going to be a a little blip and then things would bounce back. Um, you know, one of the things that we were fortunate in doing was we made a pretty gutsy call to, uh, uh, to completely and radically change the business model to one that uh, could get us profitable and allow us to control our own destiny. I remember the the bankers, you know, saying you can't do that. You know, we we just went public, and I kept thinking, well, we have to do that. It would be irresponsible right. to not uh, change course. And you know, I think in our case, what we what we came up with, you know, because that original business required constant and heavy marketing dollars to sell a product that you had a deeply discount, just like so many of those companies. Um, but what we figured out was that we wanted to partner directly with schools and have a sort of a built-in um, customer base like um, you know the official college bookstore. So we couldn't partner with the colleges and universities because, of course, those were, um, were run very profitably by the Barnes and & Nobles and the Follettes. But there was an opportunity that we saw in the the private high school market where um, uh, private high schools, unlike the public school system, actually required the parents to buy books. You didn't get the book for free when you showed up day one. And so these all these private high schools across the country had the challenge of having to operate bookstores on a scale that wasn't profitable and in a scale that you know they weren't going to convince a Barnes and Noble to come in and run it for them. So they were left doing it out of a closet or out of a cafeteria and the math teacher would, would sort of collect the money and they were selling $150,000 of books, not, not knowing what they were doing basically. And so what we did was we com- changed our, our model completely uh, from the, the, the B to C and kind of became the, a B to B company and allowed these private high schools to outsource their bookstore to us. And we set up virtual bookstores for them and basically all the assets that we had, the technology, the relationship with the book distributor, the pick, pack, and shipping capabilities, uh, we uh, leveraged all of that to the new model. And what was so beautiful about the new model, we didn't have to, uh, not only did we not have to heavily discount, but uh, our marketing went from $40 million every other semester to almost nothing because the schools, uh, we worked with them on an exclusive basis. So it ended up sort of, uh, we ended up figuring out a a, a pretty interesting model uh, out of uh, you know one that uh, uh, wasn't going to have time to, to to come to fruition, and we're able to then rebuild the business back there um, around that model. And it took took some time, and it definitely took. You know, it was a leadership challenge trying to convince everyone that we were going to be the dot com that could, and we were going to change the. The, the business and kind of show everyone who um, thought we were going to go out of business that that wasn't going to happen. And, you know, I think uh, it took about uh, two years for us to, to get profitable. And then um, some exciting things happened. We ended up um, building and growing and, and uh, actually getting relisted on the NASDAQ. I think we we're one of the few, if not only uh, dot coms from that original period to, to get th- to go public, get thrown off the NASDAQ. <laughs> And then actually get relisted, uh, and then you we get, sold you get the thrown out when your stock price gets below a buck or whatever it is. They, that's right. That's yeah. right. It's a fun. It's sort of a, a a strange process. You have to be below a buck for a certain period of time, and then you go through this this uh, this ridiculous hearing, and then um, and then in our case, we were able to uh, to build up the business and uh, and have a high enough market capitalization and stock price that. We actually got got relisted, and so that was fun. Awesome. And uh, well, yeah, I mean, but it was Pets.com well, uh, didn't come out the other side. There's so many companies that that was it. It was over. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think, and you know, as I look back on that experience, and there were you know all sorts of mistakes. You know, when when uh, I started it, I was 27. We went public. I was 29. Wow. Made all sorts of, of mistakes and all sorts of things that I you know would have done differently. But in retrospect, I think the the big decision of 
um, very relatively quickly sort of ditching that original model and figuring out a business model that could get us profitable and rallying everyone around that and then building up the, the business around that, um, you know, was, was certainly, uh, um, uh, you know, something that worked out well. And I think, uh, you know, it was a pretty gutsy call. And I think it, it, it was something that, uh, um, you know, we were very proud of because it, it uh, as you said, mo most of those dot coms aren't around. They just kind of kept what they were doing. It's hard to, especially right after you go public, to just to just radically change something. And, uh, you know, it requires all sorts of unpleasant moves um, and, and decisions that and, and sort of getting out of contracts and doing things that aren't necessarily uh, creating and building and sort of a different skill set from what that initial uh, two year period required. At your peak, how many employees did Varsity have? So this is a this is a fun uh, statistic. We went from two of us when we started yeah. to about two hundred twenty five or two hundred fifty employees when we went public. Wow. And then we, when we scale down to um, you know sort of build the business up again the second time, we scaled all the way down from two fifty to. 14 employees and then scaled back up to about a hundred. What a roller a coaster. Oh my God. It was insane. God. Insane. <laughs> and, and now, and, and of course, I'm sure you counsel your, your new, your new startup entrepreneurs and your founders that you're talking to not to look at this, but I'm, sh but I can't imagine that what the day you went public, you probably looked at your value. What was the peak? You know, it's all, it's not real money as you learned immediately. Sure. <laughs> but what was the peak value? <laughs> You must have, you must have, there must have been a moment when you go, my God, I'm worth millions. It, um, you know, I think when we went public, it was, it was towards the end of that. So it, it wasn't such the, a big... the crazy valuations, but right. I mean, the, the company was, was, the market cap was probably several hundred million dollars. Jesus. Um, you know, so <laughs> it, it definitely was exciting and it definitely, but I'll tell you what, it was the, the next five years of building up the company again and building it up profitably which in so many respects was the more rewarding time. Sure. It wasn't, um, you know, it felt real. Uh, everything we were doing was very profit minded. It was, you know, sort of like building an old fashioned business right. just online. And it was that uh, experience that I really took with me when, um, you know, we started Founders Card and, you know, that everyone is shaped by their own experiences and, you know, your perspectives are shaped by, um, you know, kind of what, what you go through. And it was that that period of time of you know having to to build a business um, when everyone thought we would fail and we were you know we were a public company even though the stock had crashed right. we still had to file our reports every quarter and yeah. hold our conference calls um, but what we did was we just hunkered down and uh, you know sort of uh, identified the business that we thought made the most amount of sense and then went after it with every bit the passion that we did the, the first two years. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a, a little bit different of a rallying cry. We weren't saving the, the poor college students from the big bad bookstore, but we were, you know, showing the world that um, we were going to be the dot com that, you know, that, that could survive. survive and, and, <laughs> yeah. uh, and, that's, and that's what we rallied against. And then uh, kind around. of in the ultimate irony, in 2008, you sell to one of the companies that had the long knives out for you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny how that happens. They were... I think I think probably two months into launching our first business, you know, we 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 got all sorts of nasty letters from, um, you know, competitors and uh, uh, and uh, and interestingly, at the end of the day, you know, that's who um, those kind of those kind of uh, companies are the ones that uh, are most intrigued. But you know, we at that point we had a, a very strong presence in that private high school market. And we also had a you know strong technology. We had you know a, a good technology strategy that I thought was that they of course thought was interesting. I want to talk about Founders Card, which has been a wild success, uh, despite the fact that you know the requirement to get in is pretty steep. But we'll talk about that in just a second. Eric Kuhn is our <laughs> guest of FoundersCard.com. Don't run over to the website and try to get in. <laughs> we'll tell you what you we'll tell you what you requires in just a second. First, though, let's talk about a startup that I'm a big fan of. Uh, I love the guys who started this. Uh, they decided they wanted to do a better stock media marketplace. And they created something called Pond Five, and this is good for you as a buyer, but it's also really good for the media 
creators. In fact, oftentimes, the Pond5 folks tell me it's the same people. The people who buy stock photos and, and uh, videos and illustrations and music and sound effects from Pond5 are oftentimes the same people who create them. So uh, one of the reasons it's great for people who are selling stock media is it's, first of all, they pay the highest royalty in the business, 50%, and you set your own price. One of the reasons it's great to be a buyer there is these are, this is royalty free. So it means you pay once and you can use it in any production, anything you want. And look at the, the variety of, of content. 1.4 million video clips, 10,000 new ones this week alone. 8.2 million photos, 23,000 new ones this week alone. 753,000 illustrations, 86,000 music tracks, more than a quarter million sound effects, 2,855 After Effects projects. And, and these are great quality. You can go to Pond5 anytime. Uh, they always have a free clip you could take a look at, minus the watermark. Uh, I love the browser, too. It really is easy to find what you're looking for on Pond5. And we've got a special offer for you, kind of a way to encourage you to try the browser, to try the search, to get a sense of what Pond5 is like and to create an account. If you go there right now and create an account, actually pond5.com slash triangulation, create an account there, you can download 50 free, royalty-free stock media files you can use in your projects, in your work. 50 of them, free! So this is a great deal. There's, there's sound effects. There's, uh, just look at this beautiful video. Most of it is 1080p or higher quality. Uh, look at the microwave countdown over there on the left, John. That's kind of cool. Now somebody just made that video and they put it on Pond5. They set the price. You buy it, they get a great royalty rate. And you know, for, for the right person, that's a great piece of video. Pond5 is so much fun. I love going in there. Yeah, and just looking at the sound effects. If you're a podcaster looking for music, you know, theme music for your show, Pond sound effects for your show, com. it's great. It's just really great. Pond5.com slash triangulation to take advantage of those 50 stock media uh, files that are yours to keep forever. If you're a, a developer for games, be great for sound effects, a designer, you know, you can get great starting points, great kind of uh, things to think about. If you're a video or filmmaker, uh, HD footage of all kinds of stuff, great travel shots. They really are shaking up the traditional stock agency business. It's an open, artist-friendly marketplace for professional content. You should check it out, pond5.com slash triangulation. Just get those 50 files now, so next time you have to do that PowerPoint, you'll have some great stuff to choose from. Thank you, Pond5, for your support of triangulation. Eric Kuhn is our guest. Go ahead, Eric. You were going to say something? Nope. Nope. He just, I'm, he just, I'm here. <laughs> he just said, hello. Eric Kuhn is our guest. He is the founder of Founders Card. You found it a couple of years ago, and you already have 10,000. What is it? 10,000? What does it take to be a member of Founders Card? So, you know, it's a little mysterious, but above all, we look for people who are connected to the entrepreneurial community. Most of our members are founders of, uh, of companies, of course. Um, you know, but increasingly we also have members who are just entrepreneurial in nature and you know, it started off because of my background, uh, the way I started it was, um, I actually sent out, uh, a hundred complimentary memberships to, uh, Smart. people in, in my past. And, you know, basically they were my test group. Right. I remember being really nervous <laughs> when I went to the, the FedEx um, place to send them out and thinking, oh my God, you know, I've just sort of jumped in the pool again. What have I done? And, you know, that sort of uh, experience, it just, you know, I've learned to just, I react well when I'm in a pressure environment, like a lot of entrepreneurs thrive off of. And so I just needed to sort of get it into a, uh, a live uh, environment with real customers. Um, but, you know, a hundred were uh, people from uh, sort of my past, and uh, many of them were fellow sort of technology venture-backed uh, uh, founders. Uh, but as we've grown from 100, quite literally, to, to over 10,000 now, we've seen the growth in a variety of ways. Um, we uh, have certainly grown in terms of geography. Uh, while uh, it, it's true that many of our members are clustered in sort of New York, the Bay Area, L.A., Chicago, uh, London, uh, Austin, sort of cities that you would expect a lot of 
entrepreneurs to, to locate. Increasingly, we're seeing applications from entrepreneurs uh, in Hong Kong, Tel Aviv, Iowa, Pittsburgh, you name Iowa. it. Iowa. <laughs> uh, ev everywhere. Yeah, I thought I'd throw that in. But, uh, Pittsburgh I get, but <laughs> Iowa, really? A <laughs> little bit from everywhere. And it's really fascinating to see the trends. Um, you know, we, we had uh, uh, a period of time because the way that we typically grow is organically through, through member referrals. And so you know, we'll, we'll get an influential member who will live in uh, Helsinki. And next thing we know through uh, his or her network, we have 40 members in, in Finland. It, it's really That's amazing the way that it's grown and how it's grown geographically. And it's, it's been, uh, um, it, it's, we, we've, I, I really tried to learn from all of my mistakes from the varsity books experience. It ended well, but there were sort of ups and downs and, uh, along the way. And, you know, with founders card, I wanted to, the first two years of founders card, I really just wanted to focus the team on developing the strongest product possible. And so every day was heads down, focused on the two components, adding stellar benefits and adding uh, fantastic networking events and opportunities for our members. And that's really day in, day out what we did. We listened to what our current members were saying, uh, what they wanted. We, we tried to, to take a very different approach. I remember Sort of all the membership organizations that I was ever a part of or familiar with. I before I started Varsity Books, I was an attorney for a year and you know, one year, back, ladies and gentlemen, one <laughs> lousy year. Go. The one happiest year attorneys I've ever met used to be attorneys. <laughs> there you go. There you go. A reformed attorney. <laughs> but um, you know, whether it's the not to pick on the American Bar Association or uh, an automobile or you know some other sort of organization. Remember the benefits programs always feeling very stale and always feeling like they were just kind of being thrown at the members and they weren't really, uh, they weren't fresh, they weren't relevant, they weren't um, inviting and they didn't really speak to who I was. And with Founders Card, we very much wanted a dynamic and participatory environment. And so we set it up so that our members are part of every aspect of what we do, and that includes recommending and suggesting benefits. So we actually have members who are founders of you know, companies that uh, create benefits for our members. We have a lot of members who will always tell us the, the benefits that they'd like to see. We have thousands of members that have posted insights alongside of Benefits, you know, like the W Hotel in San Francisco, for example, or the Ace Hotel in New York. You go onto our website and you see insights from like minded entrepreneurs. And it's really um, a, a very dynamic community uh, that, that adds a lot of value, you know, from, from that perspective. But, and, and that's really been the approach. We've tried to incorporate and uh, have everything center around the, the members participating. Of course, they, come to our networking events. Um, but every aspect of membership, we look to our members as, you know, sort of the guiding light and the, the whole purpose and, you know, kind of what we're, we're, we're doing. And then you know, I mentioned our, our sort of secret competitive advantage there is that our members are basically our, our sales force. They're out there. They love membership. They love what they're experiencing. And so they want to share that with um, people that they think can uh, contribute to and, and uh, enjoy and, and, uh, you know, benefit from the Founders Card community. And that's kind of how we've grown. V I, very differently than, than spending $40 million of marketing yeah. uh, twice a year. <laughs> yeah, you learned that lesson. I apologize I <laughs> to Silicon Prairie. Iowa is the Silicon Prairie, and it's the home to Douala. And in fact, the state government of Iowa accepts Douala payments, many of the stores for cigarette taxes, for Starbucks. So I am wrong. Iowa might be the most wired state in the union. <laughs> See, you learn something yeah. on this show. So let me, uh, let me um, when you came up with the idea, of course, I like the, I like the part where, okay, we're going to get all these entrepreneurs, and again, we're going to give them discounts. Did you also see the other side of the equation? Did it seem to you that, for instance, it would be easy to get deals for these entrepreneurs because they're so influential, they're so rich? What? I mean, is that the other side of the equation? Yeah, I mean, it's sort of the opposite of the classic 
deal site, uh, daily deal site. Which is for everybody. You get your Groupon yeah. coupon for everybody. Right. And everybody comes in, buys cupcakes, and you go out of business because you can't make <laughs> enough cupcakes. Exactly. We're sort of the inverse of that. We have a much smaller but much more influential and deeply connected member base. And so, um, you know, our members are staying at our hotels. We have we have some hotels we partner with that we do over a hundred room, a uh, thousand room nights with annually. Uh, we have um, very large, well-known brands, you know, of, of uh, companies we partner with that they just can't believe the results we get from them. And you know, what, what's very unique is our member base. You know, while they're obviously traveling and spending more money than you know the the typical typical person, they're a uh, a base that is very loyal. If they get a a product, if they get a an ongoing benefit uh, from one of our partners, um, and and usually those benefits match um, combine two elements. They usually combine uh, the the best preferred rate with some sort of elite access or VIP status. So Everybody for, likes to be a VIP. Yeah. So if you're a Virgin, if you're a Founders Card member, you not only get immediate elite access on Virgin Atlantic Airways, for example, but you also get uh, preferred rates on on flights and that formula has been very successful uh, everyone wins our members are happy because they're they're getting uh, a great ongoing benefit and our our partners our benefit partners are thrilled because they are acquiring very influential customers who uh. Uh, not only are becoming active customers and very loyal customers uh, to their brands but they're basically also becoming brand ambassadors for them because, you know, who better to have to endorse a company, um, an airline within a company than the founder. And so uh, from the, the perspective of our, our business, lifestyle, hotel and travel uh, benefit partners to win the loyalty of our members is, has really proved golden. It has this, this echo uh, factor because of the sort of influential nature uh, of the member base. So it's it's a formula that uh, is is very uh, different than that sort of daily deal type site. And uh, another fundamental difference is we don't take any commission from our benefit partners. We made a decision that we want to be curators. We want to be able to do a, uh, a partnership with a, uh, a benefit, uh, a brand, if it's right for our members and to not be compromised by uh, economics and we're also in a position to be able to negotiate better terms because we're not taking a cut for ourselves so it's a very unique model how do you make money you don't take a cut <laughs> i know it's a ridiculously silly business decision no and uh i think to the contrary we we make our money all of all memberships are uh paid memberships it's a subscription ah, model okay and so every every uh, member pays a uh, uh, an annual membership fee. how much how much is it uh, our standard fee is four ninety five, and it's uh, uh, actually going up to five ninety five uh, next a year. Uh, a year. But that's like um, American but, Express black. Well, not it's not even a black card, a platinum card. Yeah, I mean, our our members and what what we've been able to do is we've been able to not only have aspirational benefits like elite status, you know, skip the line, or you know, don't have to pay for check bags, things of that nature. Um, or upgrades at hotels or late checkouts, complimentary Wi-Fi, things like that. But we've also been able to deliver the value. So um, our members are staying at hotels they otherwise wouldn't stay, be able to stay at or certainly would be paying you know, $500 a night and they're paying $200 a night. Through, By the way, that, yeah, people I think assume founders are rich. They're not necessarily. <laughs> Right? Even if they are, every, everyone likes a deal. Right. <laughs> everyone wants. Everyone. <laughs> so wants Kevin Rose to... is a member. Leah Buskey is a member. Uh, Craig Newmark is a member. I mean, these some of these guys have money, but then there's probably a lot of guys just or gals just starting out uh, with their. Uh, how, how do you get in? You it, it, there's you have to be referred, right? Well, well, there's two ways. So you need to get an invitation, and, and there's two ways to get an invitation. You either get an invitation from an existing member. Uh, every member is, is allowed to to refer. Uh, 10, 10 people. Mm -hmm. um, and the other way is you go to founderscard.com slash membership and you fill out that form and we then uh, selectively uh, send invitations to, you know, to people that we think, uh, again, that would contribute to, to the community. It's, it's really important that we maintain the integrity of the member base. Th this is very different than anything I've done. While 
uh, growing the member base is, and, and growing the pool of benefits, the collection of benefits is, is what it's all about. Um, it, it's only done under the lens of high quality. And it, it's important to us that our members, uh, that, that we maintain a, a, a very high caliber um, on the member base because that's what allows us to get these extraordinary benefits. It's what uh, gives the events. Um, and we have incredible events. We just had one during CES for our members at the, uh, the, uh, the Mandarin Oriental Hotel in Las Vegas, a fantastic event. We have one coming up in New York next month. Uh, we also have an uh, incredible event at the W in Austin during South by Southwest, and these are member-only events. And it's you know important to maintain the integrity of the member So people want to get in. Not only do they want the deals, but they, they, if you the access to some of these other founders would be fabulous for some people, right? Yeah, I mean, in, in many respects, for, for many members, it's the events and the access and the networking that right. is the, the big part. And the, the benefits are sort of icing on the cake, you know, elite status with, with uh, uh, Hertz and, and so forth. That those are sort of icing on the cake that goes along with it. But, you know, kind of going back to how to get in and who gets in, we, we intentionally, one of the things I've always loved about the entrepreneurial ecosystem is that there isn't this elitism or snobbiness that pervades other industries where uh, successful people only hang out and want to help uh, other successful people. In the entrepreneurial world, I, I very much um, you know, love how first-time entrepreneurs and some of the best known entrepreneurs can mingle and help each other. Uh, well-known entrepreneurs, experienced entrepreneurs love mentoring uh, freshly minted new entrepreneurs. There's a special connection oh, yeah. that entrepreneurs have, and and you know I see that at all of our events. Um, and you know it's it's sort of the the what we're trying to fashion in our uh, networking events and, and opportunities is that that sense. And so um, it would it would not be true to say that all of our members are you know extremely successful ten time serial entrepreneurs that you know appear on the cover of, uh, of Forbes every month. We uh, also, of course, have many first-time entrepreneurs um, and everyone in between. And that's the beauty of Founders Card and I think in many respects the you know, sort of that general ecosystem of, of uh, entrepreneurs. It seems to me now that you've got a model that's gonna that works great with entrepreneurs, but that could also be applied to other groups. Is are you thinking along those lines? Well, you know, it's on one hand, a, as an entrepreneur, you just want to sort of grow so you're, it. And you see an your opportunity. Buddies. Yeah. You just yeah. see something that's working, and you want to extend it. Um, but one of the things I learned in previous experiences is when you've identified something that works well. Um, you don't want to take your eye off of it uh -huh. and run the risk of defocusing. That's, I think tempt the, that's tempting, isn't it? It's, uh, it's highly tempting. Yeah. I think one of the... the well, isn't it what Steve Jobs said? He says the most important thing you can say is no. I think that's right. I mean, I think, I think saying no, knowing when to say no, and not getting bogged down on all of the you know, sexier, exciting partnerships right. or ideas that aren't going to work and consume resources and time. That's the great challenge of being an entrepreneur, understanding which ones are, are, are those that, um, you know, are sort of aligned with your mission and what you're trying to accomplish and to deeply focus and execute on those and to be comfortable um, saying no. And so what, what we've done is, you know, we, we say no a lot. Um, and, no, um, by the way, I, no, <laughs> not to new founders members. No to ideas, to diversification. You want to stick to your knitting. It's a, I see the same thing all the time. I have all these ideas of things we could do, but they would be a distraction. Yeah, sometimes if you try too many things, or you to try to be everything to to everyone, you end up with nothing. Right. And and I think the the, the there's a fine line between the sort of the strength and the weakness of, of a startup, um, and that has to do with focus and it has to do with, um, you know, not, not defocusing. It has to do with recognizing opportunities that work and proving those and focusing on them uh, when they do and uh, avoiding temptation from, you know, all of the, um, you know, and every day we're getting introductions from people who want to be, be benefit partners or oh, that's um, introduction. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it, 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 and that's the fun part. And uh, I love this part in the company cycle. When you first start, no one knows who you are right. and you're 
muscling and, and hustling to get in the, the door with everyone and, um, you know, calling up well-known companies and trying to convince them of your, to buy into your dream. Uh, and then, you know, slowly but surely, in our, you know, our case, it took a few years um, and, you know, all of a sudden that changes. People that didn't want to work with you uh, all of a sudden are kind of banging down your doors and, you know, some of that starts happening and that's really fun and that's uh, always uh, interesting to watch. But, um, you know, staying true to that purpose, that mission, that focus, uh, while, you know, it doesn't mean you don't constantly improve the product and iterate it and improve it, that's part of it, but... Um, it, it, it does mean that, that you, you say no to a lot of things and, you know, it's, it's, uh, sometimes people get, get, uh, bummed out on our team when, you know, we end up, uh, not trying a new idea or not, uh, uh, doing a certain, uh, partnership because, you know, it, we think it's only going to, uh, complicate things or it's not going to end up, uh, helping us get to where we need to be. And, and, and so we've really just focused on, quality um, and, and, and partnerships that doesn't mean it has to be the most well-known brand, but it, you know, we, we love working with, with newer innovative uh, uh, partners as well, but we want it to, to sort of be in that sweet spot of what we think is going to excite and add value to our members. One of the real challenges that companies like Groupon and Living Social face, Google too, I guess, is you got to have a huge sales force on the ground to generate all these coupons. I guess you don't have that problem. Yeah, it's a very different sale when, you know, you go to a, an airline or a hotel because, you know, we have a, a proven track record of performance with a very well-known companies. Right. And um, it's also a very different, uh, the economics of the equation are very different. We're not going to them and saying, you know, um, give us a, a, a third of or 40% right. of every transaction. We're, we're uh, going to them and saying, you know, we have this fantastic member base. Let's figure out how to structure an ongoing right. partnership that's going to add value to everyone. Right. And so it, it's a, uh, a much different conversation. It's more of, you know, sort of a, a collaboration as opposed to a, uh, you know, a, a hard knuckle fought uh, negotiation. And uh, it's, uh, um, you know, it's worked out well for, for all involved. What's your biggest challenge? Well, I mean, I think the the unique challenge with you know ev every company uh, has, has daily challenges. I think um, we've been very f fortunate in that. I I like to think I've experienced you know, not much phases me when it comes to to crises and different things that that uh, can occur in a company. I've sort of seen a lot of it um, in my past, but. Um, one of the unique challenges with Founders Card is that th there is probably some natural limitation to the capital our membership because if you think about you have to um, keep it quality. Yeah, exactly. And if you think about what excites and what our members value, um, they value incredibly incredible uh, events at fantastic venues with quality members. They value. Um, best in kind partnerships, you know, immediately elite status, skip the line, VIP treatment, uh, matched with a fantastic pr preferred rates. There are, you know, if you went to ABC airline and said, Hey, I've got a million members. How about upgrading them all to gold? Yeah. That's and, not going to work. You know, giving them 10%. <laughs> they, they say, go fly a kite. Yeah. You know, that's not going to work. And so, um, the, I think there's a, there's a challenge, but it's sort of a reality that, you know, at some point, um, you know, you, you will have a waiting list. At some point, there'll be a natural cap. Now, we're, we're certainly not there yet, but that's something that we closely monitor, and we want to make sure that we we um, are, are, are smart about the, the right number. But, you know, uh, right now, additional members, additional entrepreneurs are, you know, adding value to, to this very dynamic community. Do you qualify by income? Uh, so interestingly, no, we intentionally don't. I mean, some of the other entrepreneurial groups, um, some of the other, uh, certainly, you know, credit cards require a whole slew of sort of financial requirements. We, we do ask for in the application, so it's a three-page application that does um, ask for information about uh, uh, the applicant's company and, you know, sort of where it to it captures information in terms of, you know, where they are and, and so forth. But it, it's not with an eye to excluding um, people who 
haven't reached a certain income level or a certain stature within their company. It's the application process is much more with an eye to um, achieve people who are connected to the entrepreneurial community. So that's kind of what we look for evidence of. Uh, in the application process, we're not looking for people. You know, we're, we're not asking for pay stubs, social security numbers. We're not asking for no, we don't, Credit we don't check. do. A, uh, yeah, right. An yeah. IRS report. That's not us. But what we want to do, you know, we ask for LinkedIn profile because we want to look and see um, your involvement to the entrepreneurial community. We love people who are. And again, it doesn't. It, it, a lot of people sort of um, associate entrepreneurial community with venture backed founder or a technology company. And that's really uh, a misnomer. We have applicants every day who are, you know, they're uh, uh, a founder of a uh, boutique PR firm, or they're a, we have people who are freelancers. Uh, we have people who are um, in, in, you know, physicians, founding physicians of medical practices, um, we, we really, you know, and that enriches the, the Founders Card community. We're definitely not looking exclusively for uh, people at a certain, um, you know, sort of level of uh, performance and or industry. We have, um, you know, people that are in the fashion industries. We have uh, oh, athletes, so does, professional athletes. It doesn't have athletes. to be tech, tech startups. It, it, it could C correct. Not at all. It, it, it very much is. Um, there's, you know, small business owners. There are um, people that are, you know, entrepreneurial and deeply entrepreneurial in other ways. And so it's, you know, it's definitely not entrepreneur founders card equals only a founder of a venture backed technology company. That, of course, um, is a uh, a strong component of our member base, but by no means is that uh, the entirety of our member base. You got to do a dating service, though. I mean, that would really. <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes you look for for opposites, or sometimes it's better to have people that are, I don't know, too too high strong entrepreneurs on all. That's a bad uh, idea. <laughs> Take it from me. Yeah. It's, you know, it's kind of a it's it's. I could see after the crazy roller coaster of varsity, that you were looking for uh, something that would be fun and be a good startup, but also, we just we just kind of works, and it seems like this is a great match between. The founders who want to get to know each other and get these elite deals, and companies who would love to have these people as as customers. I mean, it seems like it's one of those businesses that just does itself. Yeah, I mean, if you are Lufthansa, for example, or Cathay yeah, Pacific, you want these guys. Your your you know your sales force is set up to go after and uh, and 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 sort of sell to large companies, Fortune 500 companies, and investment banks, but you're not set up well to identify right. and partner with, um, you know, the, the who's who and the, you know, 15-person recently backed company that's going to be the next, the next part huge success. Yeah, you got yeah, and yeah. so. Um, and you get them, they, you get them early, that's the time to get them. Yep, and with one partnership with Founders Card, they are basically accomplishing, um, you know, what what would be a uh, a very challenging uh, sales for, uh, for, sure. from their aspect, and so that's kind of how we're able to deliver for our members uh, benefits that um, you know, in some cases, are are even better than uh, what executives at the the very largest companies are are able to get. Yeah, very cool. What a great idea. Did, you, did it come to you in the middle of the night and you leapt out nope. of bed? And said, I have it. <laughs> it, it was, it, it's the kind of thing when, you know, you sort of rack your brain trying to think of a new idea. You know, for Founders Card for me was in many respects a, a series of, uh, of different epiphanies. It wasn't sort of just one. It was um, different things from that Varsity Books experience that I looked back on and said, you know, I wish I had that. Like, you know, I'll give you one quick example. When we were on our road show and going public and we were staying in, you know, Four Seasons Hotels, Ritz Carlton, St. Regis, the nicest hotels. And I found out that, you know, our rates, you know, we were paying like $200 for rooms that everyone else was paying five, $600 and we were getting upgraded. I was thinking, what, what's going on? And it, you know, turned out these investment bankers had negotiated these amazing rates and uh, amenities for for their employees and their their customers, and you know, it always struck me as odd that it was the the entrepreneurs that that you know I thought and, and to believe are the the value creators who better 
uh, deserves these kind of benefits than uh, than entrepreneurs. And so it was different things from my background that kind of were lodged somewhere in my sub subconscious that when I was thinking of, or my conscious that when I was then thinking of the next thing to do it was sort of a combination of uh, putting the the networking and the the networking the way I wish it always was yeah. with the, the benefits together in a, you know, a very dynamic yeah. community. I mean, if you could, I mean, it's, it's so and now, it, now in hindsight, it's obvious if you could create a mailing list of 10,000 of the top up and coming young executives that are about to take over the world, that would be so valuable. And here what you have, it's kind of like Facebook is people coming to you saying, yeah, can I get on it? Please, please. I want to be on that list. <laughs> it's perfect. It's brilliant. Nice job. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Eric Kuhn, founderscard.com. Com. And uh, it's, a, it's obviously a club that uh, none of us will get to join, but we can look from afar. And, <laughs> Not and, true. <laughs> and, and, and I'll wave at Kevin Rose as he goes in that, uh, you know, that elite line at the next Virgin America flight we're on together. Thank you, Eric. Great to talk to you. Take care. Nice Take talking care. to you. Bye-bye. Eric Kuhn, founderscard.com. We do triangulation every Wednesday. Right about, eh, it's supposed to be about 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. Uh, and you can always watch live. We'd like it if you watch live. I often get questions and ideas from the chat room. Not today. They were having too much fun. But <laughs> normally. Uh, and uh, if you can't watch live, well, you can always get it after the fact. On-demand audio and video available uh, on our website, twit.tv slash TRI, or everywhere that uh, podcasts are generally found. Who's next week, Karsten Bondi? Jerry Pornell would be fun. We're trying to nail him down. It's like nailing jello to a tree. Yes, but once <laughs> we're working on it, uh, that will be a lot of fun. We do, uh, we do have some great people lined up in the future for triangulation. This is always so much fun because we get to talk to such interesting people. I thank you for joining me, and we'll see you next time on Triangulation. Triangulation.